Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as you can see, Pastor Bob and I are trying to practice a little bit of social distancing. I think this is enough room, uh, kind of like you see on TV where the anchors are all sitting across from each other, very distant. So uh, we're, we're wanting to, to honor that this morning. Um, let's pray and enter into worship with our Lord Jesus. Lord, we come to you this morning looking to lay aside our worries, anxieties, and troubles we face to worship you. I would ask that you, our Lord, would fill us afresh with your spirit and your presence. I pray that our worship would be a sweet scent to you and that we could meet together in spirit this morning. Amen. Voices, these truths about our great God. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. No one like you, none like you. Oh, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you we're singing our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is here
we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Yeah. 
Jesus, I'll not be shaken with my feet firmly planted on you. We put our trust in you. We put our trust in you. trust in you when all around when all around is shaking all around is shaking I'll put my trust in you put my trust in you you alone you alone we put our trust in you we put our trust in you Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Jesus, in all our ways, we will acknowledge you. Make our paths straight. Direct us in the way that we should go. For our trust is in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Uh, I would like to take this time now to pray for our families and our young people of our church. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we come to you this morning asking for a special blessing for our families and young people. I would pray this time could be used for our families to come closer around you, Lord. Help our families to look at you and to worship you together. We may be anxious about the things that are going on, but you aren't. You are not surprised, Lord, or scared about our current situation. I would ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to fill us with hope and love and to keep our eyes fixed on you. I pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about trusting God in times of crisis. Today, the world is in a crisis. It's called coronavirus. We are experiencing all the impact, all of the precautions that we need to be taking to make sure that we don't spread this virus that's going around the world. And some of you may be struggling why we're not in a physical church, but we need to be wise, but we also need to be prudent. And in order for us to be able to do that, we needed to uh, do this so that we could protect you and protect us. And actually, what we're praying for is that this whole thing would happen very quickly and that we would be able to get back to life normal. We don't wanna, we don't wanna be in trouble that way. So today, this world is in crisis. In Canada, we're in a crisis as well. And also in our province, we have been aware of all the things that have been going on in these last few days with the many different uh, updates from both our Prime Minister and also from my Premier. Today, your life may be in another crisis. Your life may be crushed by something else altogether. So what can we learn from Jesus about dealing with the crushing blows that come our way in life? Are there any lessons for us to learn from him? Well, on Good Friday, you will see and learn about the olive press and how important it was to Israel's economy. Uh, but what I want you to just understand is that there's a couple of things that we need to look at that are in your notes. Today, I want to really kind of make reference as well at the same time to the movie called The Passion of the Christ. Because if you ever watched that movie and experienced how those that put it together depicted the brutal realities of the crucifixion of Christ, you're going to understand some of the things that we looked at. And so at the start of the movie, the movie actually starts with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But here's what I want you to understand. The word Gethsemane means olive press. Olive press. Well, what does that mean? Gethsemane means a life that is crushed. So how does that show up in our lives? How does that Gethsemane show up in our lives? Well, I think there are a number of things. One, by disappointment. You had your hopes up for a new position. Maybe you had your hopes up for a, a new relationship. Maybe you had your hopes up for a new job. And with all that's been going on, now that's been dashed. You've been 
disappointed. What about disillusionment? Maybe you are, are disillusioned about life and, and about your purpose, or maybe even the pain that's in your life today. Maybe you're trying to understand what's going on with this whole virus thing. You're disillusioned. What about by desertion? Someone very close to you has ripped your life in part, walked away from you, deserted you, no longer a part of your life or family. That's a Gethsemane, folks. That's a crushing. What about a divorce? Maybe you've experienced your hopes and your dreams and your future and your children have been crushed because of a, because of a decision of one of the parents. That's a crushing. That's a Gethsemane. What about death? Tragically or suddenly, maybe you're all, alo- all alone. Now you're struggling and, and you're experiencing this crushing blow. This past week, my mom passed away. That was a Gethsemane for me and for my family. You see, there's an olive press for all of us. And I want you to see from my own life experience how that's impacted me, how my life has been crushed by personal experiences. I could give you many of many examples, but let me give you a couple of them. One of them was a a uh, partner in ministry that we that I had. I, when I went to a church that was in Ontario, and there were four individuals that interviewed me at, to come and to be the lead pastor there. And between when I candidated there and when I arrived, within about six months after that, three out of the four people left the church and left me all on my own. I was crushed. The people I was with were crushed. One of my times in ministry, I had a prayer partner ministry where I had people that actually would pray with me, men in the church, and we had a day every, uh, we had a prayer partner every day, so basically the month was filled and they would pray for me on the day of their birthday anniversary. So if their birthday was the 18th of August, like mine is, then what would happen is on the 18th of every month they would call me and we would pray together. And I remember having one my very own prayer partner take me out for lunch and negotiate my relationship with him. And all of a sudden I realized he, was, he, he wasn't in it for the relationship. He was in it for what he wanted. And I was crushed because when I didn't give him what he wanted, he walked away. What about people that have turned their back on you who have been very close to you? I've had many people in my life, not only in ministry and outside of ministry, even in my relationships, where I've had people walk away from me and absolutely devastated my life. All of us have Gethsemanes. What's your Gethsemane this morning? Maybe this experience with this coronavirus is actually impacting you more than you really think. It's, it's just really, uh, it's, it's just impacting your mind, it's impacting your thoughts, it's impacting your, your, your tension, your stress. Is this your Gethsemane? Maybe. Well, this morning for a few moments, I want to just give you a couple of lessons from the Olive Press. And an Olive Press, if you were ever to go to Israel, and I've had the privilege of going there a couple of times, you will have the opportunity to go to an Olive Press, which actually is in the ground. It's down where it's cool. And in it is an incredible machinery that takes and puts these Olive Uh, olives in bags, and then it crushes them with the weight of this instrument. And out of it, presses all of the oil. So let me talk to you a little bit about that. What can we learn from Jesus to help us get through our own olive press, our own Gethsemanes? Well, you may be asking here today, why did Jesus have to go through all of this? I mean, we're coming up to Easter, and that's why we're really looking at this series Next week, I'm going to look at the power of love. Because of God's love for us, he gave his one and only son for us that we could be back in relationship with him. You see, Jesus in the garden, we understand that he was asking for God to remove the cup of suffering that was from him. There was a song that we used to sing when I was younger that said, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and for me. You may be here this morning and you might be saying, well, God, remove this cup of suffering for me. And God may seem silent. He may seem distant. 
it may seem absent. What can you do when your friends desert you? Well, let's look at the life of Jesus. There's a couple of things that I'd like to share with you. Number one is seek out trusted friends to carry you. Just a few chapters back in Mark chapter 2, we read of a man who was a paraplegic who experienced his own disappointment, his own life of poverty, and he needed those close to him to carry him to be at the feet of Jesus. You see, he had to place his trust in the hands of other people. As I was sharing earlier this year about the five purposes of the church and for the purposes of our life, we were, I, I shared with you that one of the purposes that we're created for is fellowship, for connections. Each one of us here, at times in our lives, need Jesus with skin on. Yes, we know God is here. Yes, we know that God loves us. Yes, we know that God is in control, but sometimes we just need a warm body to walk along the road with us. And so did Jesus. In fact, in Mark 14, verse 34, you will see these words. He went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, let's just talk a little bit about this setting. Here, Jesus was with his closest friends, with his inner circle. What does it say? He took Peter, James, and John. That was the inner three. And then it clearly communicates here his agony and his pain. It said that he became deeply troubled and distressed. He said, my soul is crushed with with grief to the point of death. And then he explains what he needs at this moment in his life. He needs his friends to stay there and watch. And you know what? The saddest part of this whole thing was they were oblivious to his hour of need. You know, at the age of 20, we worry about what, others people, what other people think of us. At the age of 40, we, we dare what they think about us. But by the age of 60, we discover that they haven't even been thinking about us at all. <laughs> Ever been there before? Just when you needed a friend, when you needed a spouse, when you needed a business partner, they bolt? Isn't it amazing how difficult circumstances in your life filters out really who your friends are? It's sad, but it's true. King David understood this. His son Absalom was rebelling against him in Matthew or in Psalm 55. It says, it was not an enemy who taunted me. I could bear that. It wasn't my foes who were so arrogantly insulting me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it was you, my equal, my companion, my close friend. In one translation, it says, my best friend. What good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. You see, his hurt comes from a very unlikely source. His best friend, his son. The greatest pain in your life, the greatest pain in my life is often comes from someone that we share our lives with. Someone who knows your deepest thoughts. Someone who knows your greatest fears. Someone who knows your fondest dreams. Why is that? Because the people closest to us know the most about us. I'm reminded of the the movie called The Hunt for Red October. Sean Connery, who's Ramus, the Russian captain, and Alex Baldwin, who's Jack Ryan, a CIA analyst. Uh, Remember what was happening was uh, Ramus was actually gone dark from the Russians and he was on his way to the U.S. and they couldn't find out where he was. And so they brought this CIA gentleman by the name of Jack Ryan onto this American submarine to go out and find him. And the reason why he got on there was because he knew everything about that Russian captain. And he's asked, why why do you know what he's going to do? He said, because I've been studying him for the last 10 years or so. I know every move that he's going to make. It's the people that know every move that you're going to make that oftentimes are the ones who bring the greatest crushing into our lives. But we need to seek out a trusted friend to be Jesus. 
with skin on. Even though we've been hurt by other people, we still need other people. And what it really means is that we have to go and find other people to come alongside us just like Jesus did. The sad reality for you, like Jesus, is you might not know who is trusted till you need them, but we still need them. That's the first thing. The second thing is you need to state your pain to the Father candidly. What do you do when you're all alone? Well, step into the garden, even if it's just by yourself, because, my friend, you are never alone. Do you really struggle with the concept of being truly honest with God? Again, Look at what Jesus models for us, because we get a clue from him. In this passage, it says, verse 35, he went on a little further and fell to the ground, and he prayed that, if it were possible, this awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. I, but yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Some things I want you to see here. He communicated like a son to his dad, because what he says in this essence is he calls him Abba, Father. Well, if you were to ever go to Israel and be with people who were from Israel, and you had a father and son together, you would hear the word Abba all the time. Abba, 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 Abba. It was just an incredible experience to have that when I was in a kibbutz once uh, with one of our teams that we went over with, and to hear that and to see the joy on the faces of the father and the son. It was very intimate. He communicated his conviction that God was in control. I know that you know everything. I know that you can do everything. And he communicates his desire for God to find relief from his cup of pain. And here we have the Son of God, who knows the plan of salvation, asking his Father to find a different way. It almost sounds unspiritual. It almost sounds rebellious. Psalm 142, verse 2 says, I cried out to the Lord. I pray to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my problems to him. I tell him my troubles. You see, what Jesus knew and what the psalmist knew and what you need to know today is that you can lay yourself out before God and you can tell him exactly how you're feeling, where your disappointments are, where your hurts are, where your crushing is. And he's not going to turn you away. You may be here this morning and you can't pour out your pain because of the depth of your Gethsemane. It may be just too risky, but here is someone who you can tell, and he's trustworthy. Don't bottle it up. Bring it out to your father. He can clean up the mess. The Psalms are full of chapters where David just absolutely vents out to God. Listen, chapter 5, he says, Listen to my cry for help, my God, my King. For I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait patiently and expectantly. You may ask, how intense can I get with God? Well, again, Jesus gives us a depth of intensity that I don't think you or I will ever get to. But it was okay with his Father. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, another description of the very same account that we're looking at in Mark chapter 14. He says, For he was in such agony of spirit that he broke into a sweat of blood and great drops falling to the ground as he prayed more and more earnestly. Now, I've been in some painful situations, folks. But I've never prayed so hard that blood was pushed out of my sweat glands. You see, Jesus teaches us that it's healthy. It's wise to pour out your heart's pain to him. You see, there are two mistakes that we often make. One, we wait for God to change our circumstances. And two, we wait for our circumstances to change our behavior. But why is it necessary to pour out our heart to God? Because God wants you to lean into his arms, to hear his heart, to know his will. God may never change your circumstance, but in the midst of your travail, he may change you and give you peace. The third thing I want you to see this morning, and you're doing great, just hang in there, is safeguard yourself from sin. 
safeguard yourself from sin. Charlie Brown was lying in bed one night and he says out loud, this is his statement, sometimes I lie awake at night and ask, where have I gone wrong? And then a voice says to me, this is going to take more than one night. (laughs) It has been noticed that the greatest time for Satan, the enemy of your soul to come knocking in your door is when you're faced with the greatest difficulty. When you are at your greatest point of pain, he will always mention an option, an easy way for you to fill you with doubt about even God's love or to do something even different. It's amazing to me that even in the midst of Jesus' greatest time of testing, his concern is about his disciples because look at what Luke records about this event. In Luke chapter 22, verse 40, on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Interesting. He didn't pray that he wouldn't fall into temptation. He prayed for them that they wouldn't fall into temptation. A certain woman could not avoid the temptation to buy new clothes. And I know any woman here on watching this online doesn't have this problem, so just listen, let me tell you this story. But each time she was in a clothing store, she ended up purchasing two or three dresses or suits at increasing cost. Like, it was just unbelievable. Her husband became concerned about the fi- family finances. And when he brought it up to her, she simply said, I'm sorry, I just can't help it. I try an address and I like it and I buy it. Makes sense. Her husband replied, Why don't you just resist the temptation? Why don't you say something like, Satan, get behind me? And she said, well, I tried that. And she said, and Satan simply said, it looks good from back here too. (laughs) See, Jesus understands that we are human, that we're frail. And he understands that about us too. When your kids were really small, did you expect them to be perfect? Of course not. You watched them. You tried to guide them. You tried to protect them. You were always watching, concerned about them. Remember, your daddy's watching. Look at the passage again in Mark chapter 14, verse 37. When he returned and found the disciples asleep, he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Can't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. What a picture of the struggle we experience in our lives so many times. Part of us is eager to want more from God, to go deeper, to experience his anointing, to experience his peace, to make a difference in this world. But there's another part of us that's not willing to pay the price. All of us have good intentions, but few of us live intentionally. In Mark chapter 10, verse 37, we see that James and John has a very spe- have a very special request. One wants to sit on the left hand of the throne. One wants to sit on the right hand of the throne. So what was one of the temptations? Was it stature? Was it succession? Was it success? While Jesus was anticipating partaking of this cup, his disciples were thinking of power and prestige and position and privilege. None of his disciples were think, was thinking about suffering, counting the cost, and paying the price to do the will of God. Why did Peter sell out Jesus? When we're facing the cup of Gethsemane, we are tempted to try to figure it out, to get out of the bind, to gain control by our own strength. I can handle this. That's what Peter said. And that's what we often say. That's what you say. That's what I say. We have that can-do attitude. We're strong enough. But we need to put up the rails in our life to prevent us from going over the edge. For Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, if you think you're standing alone, be careful. You too may fall into the same sin. We need to watch ourselves in a time of crisis. And lastly, number four, we need to surrender to the will of God. E. Stanley Jones said this, prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God and the cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull it, I do not pull the shore to me, but I pull myself to the shore. Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. And we see this in the life of Jesus here in the garden. 
For in Luke or in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, he says, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. You see, friends, don't give up on God. Give in to what he's asking you to walk through. Obedience leads to blessing. He knows what's on the other side of your crisis. He knows how strong you will become in the midst of this crisis we're going through. He knows the impact that you will have when you park, park through your darkest hour. Your father knows best because he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Notice again that Jesus did not go to God once and just plead his case. He went again and again. And again. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 42, it says, Again he left them and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot go away until I drink it all, your will be done. Friend, if Jesus, who was God, who knew the plan of the Father before the foundation of the world, if he requested a way out, you and I ought to be encouraged that it's okay to struggle with surrendering to the will of God, especially when we don't know what's coming. You see, we're just like the disciples. We get weary in the fight. We get lost in the uncertain of certainty of future, and we fall asleep. Look at what it says in our passage, verses 39 and 42. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they could not keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. How quickly do we give up on praying for God's deliverance in our Gethsemane? On Good Friday, I'm going to state that God has everything that Jesus needs in this hour. During these times of crushing is when we see the anointing of God flowing into our lives if we surrender to his will. Yet, what if God doesn't allow us to let go? What do we do? Do we resist his will or do we rebel? You see, we have the same choice as Jesus did. Jesus did not lose his life. He gave up his life. He surrendered. E. Stanley Jones said this, If you don't surrender to Christ, you'll surrender to chaos. Now, isn't that a word for our day today? Let me recap. How do you trust God in times of crisis? You seek out trusted friends to carry you. How do you handle the pressure of the Gethsemane in your life? You state your pain to your father candidly. How do you outlast the pressure of your life being crushed? You safeguard yourself from sin. And how do you allow God to make your circumstances a blessing to other people? You surrender to the will of God. Last year, I went to an AA meeting to support a friend who celebrated 15 years of sobriety. I was so proud of him. In fact, there were actually three pastors there. I leaned over to a friend during the opening and whispered, hey, there are three pastors in the AA meeting. Something's not right here. And he laughed. What I heard that night was this story of a man who for many years denied that he had a drinking problem. He was fine. But he had to experience his own Gethsemane to start the journey back to sobriety. Every alcoholic has a sponsor, and they attend weekly meetings, and they help others as necessary to walk down the road of recovery. And as I witnessed the love, and I felt the support, I heard the dependence of God, and I heard the hand of God in the celebration of this man's journey. In my mind, I had this question, though. How would this church look if we just admitted our own self-sufficiency and just surrendered to God? How our lives would be different. How our relationships would be different. How our impact in our community would be different. How we would be able to respond to the crisis that we're living in today, would that also be different? One will only know as we surrender and we trust God 
in a time of crisis. Let me pray with you. Father God, I thank you for this day that you have made, and I thank you for the privilege that we have of just meeting together, even though it's somewhat new being online. But I thank you that you can speak to us through your word, regardless of whether we're in a building or whether we're here in an online community. Lord, you know the Gethsemane that each one of us is going through right now, especially with what's happening in our world, what's happening in our province, what's happening in many lives. Lord, may we just continue to trust you in this time of crisis. Lord, I pray for those who need to seek out friends to carry them, that you will bring people around them to help them and encourage them and support them. I pray, Father, for those who are in pain that they really just need to be courageous enough to pour out their pain before you and be as candid as possible, knowing that you love them unconditionally. You will never push them away. And Father, for those that are in the midst of this situation of a crisis and they're tempted to take an easy way out, they're tempted to compromise, they're tempted to just throw it all to the wind, I pray, Lord, that you will give them the ability to guard their lives for making decisions that will just harm them and their families for eternity. And I pray, Father, that you would, in the midst of this situation, with this crisis in our land, that for those of us that follow you, that call you our Lord and our Savior, that, God, we would continually surrender our will to your will so that we can be used by you. Father, I just pray that as we go throughout this week, and who knows what's going to come this week, only you do. I pray, God, that you will bless us with an understanding that you are in control and that you love us and that you've got this. And we need to just trust in you and not allow the enemy of our soul or the news feeds that we watch to fill our lives with fear. May we be prudent, may we be wise, but may we also be courageous to trust in you. Bless us this day and this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. I will bless your name Yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy all my days Oh yes, I will, oh yes I will The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high. Bless your name, yeah. yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes, I will for all my days, oh yes, I will, and I choose to pray. Glorify
glorified, glorify the name of all names. But nothing can stand again. I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names. But nothing can stand again. Oh yes, I will. If you hide in the lowest valley, yes, I will. Bless your name. Yes, I will. Sing for joy. Well, before we leave and uh, close off our online service today, we're just glad, first of all, that you've been with us. I know it's been a little bit of a stretch, and I, I, just, I just pray that you've experienced the presence of God wherever you are. Um, I just want to bring your attention to a couple of things at the end, and I, I want you to know that uh, you can reach out to us at any time. If you'd like to know information about what's going on in the church, we need to have your email address. So you can email to office at wacalliance.ca. We'll have it again in the comments below so that you'll make sure you can have it. If you get it to us, we'll make sure that we will update you on what's happening of any changes because as we know, things are changing all the time. Uh, the other thing is we're going to have, we also have a WhatsApp group and in the comments below, put a little uh, QR code that you can actually put your phone up to that will gain you access right into the group. And again, it's just another way for us to be able to instant message you about what's going on. About our office. Our office is officially closed, just like our church is officially closed. We're not having any public services here at all, uh, just because we're living in compliance with what's happening with the government and, and, and their wisdom and instructions for us. But the reality is, uh, we still need to have an opportunity for you to come. If you're not giving online, and you can, there's going to be a button that you can go to or go to our website and use push pay. You can, you can give your money that way as well. Or if you still don't have the opportunity, uncomfortable with that, and you want to use uh, a check and you want to drop that off of the office, or if you want to use the debit machine that now we have at the church. The church office will be open for those who want to come and donate between 10 and 1 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we would just trust that if you're not well, that you won't come. Uh, it's for your protection, it's for our protection, but we want to provide those of you that don't have the ability to use push uh, pay, push pay uh, to come and be able to get to our church. As you know, uh, we're going to be uh, really pressed financially with this whole situation of not being able to meet together. So I would just encourage you, if you're able to lean in a little bit for us to get us through this crisis so that we can make sure everything continues to operate. I believe that's all of the announcements I need to share with you. Um, other than that, you might see that we're going to pop up a, a, a Zoom prayer time together. And again, we'll put more information on our, our Facebook page, so make sure that you're a part of that. And uh, you can just gather with us, and we're going to do some things to interact with you throughout the week to be connected. So thank you for being with us. We're grateful that you're here, and we look forward to seeing you next week. So take care. God bless.